All right, folks, coming up on Roller Martin Unfiltered for Monday, March 4th, 2019. More injustice in regards to police killing unarmed black men in Sacramento. No charges for the cops who shot and killed Stephon Clark in his grandparents' backyard. Also, no federal civil rights charges for the T Oklahoma police officer who shot and killed Terrence Crutcher while he had his hands up. We'll talk to his sister, Dr. Tiffany Crutcher, on the show. Part one of the HBO documentary charging Michael Jackson with being a pedophile is pissing off the Jackson family. They are upset and they plan to sue HBO. We'll talk to Michael's nephew, Taj Jackson, live from the UK. Former Attorney General Eric Holder says he is not running for president. Bernie Sanders is running for president but as a Democrat, but he also filed to run as a senator, as an independent. He stopped by the Breakfast Club to share his thoughts on his black agenda. I was in Selma this weekend for the 54th commemoration of Bloody Sunday, and we captured uh, some great folks talking about various issues, including Reverend William Barber, Hillary Clinton, Sherilyn Eiffel, the NAACP Legal Defense Fund, and Senator Cory Booker. We'll share all of that with you. 
And the head of the United Negro College Fund, Michael Lomax, is here to tell us which of our folks in Congress are doing right by HBCUs. It's time to bring the funk on Roller Martin Unfiltered. Let's go. He's got it. Whatever the miss, he's on it. Whatever it is, he's got the scoop, the fact, the fine. And when it breaks, he's right on time. And it's rolling. Best believe he's knowing. Putting it down from swaths to news to politics. With entertainment just for kicks, he's rolling. Yeah. Yeah. It's on go, go, roll, roll, y'all. Yeah. Yeah. It's rolling, my ten, yeah. 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 Rolling with rolling now. Yeah. He's funk, he's fresh, he's real, the best you know. He's rolling, my ten. All right, folks, uh, it was about a year ago when two Sacramento police uh, officers shot and killed Stephon Clark in his grandparents' backyard. Well, on Friday, the Sacramento County DA, Anne Marie Schubert, announced that officers Terrence Mercado and Jared Robinette acted within the law when they shot and killed 22-year-old Clark seven times. The killing has sparked days of protests in Sacramento, including one that blocked fans out of a Sacramento beef, Sacramento uh, basketball game. This decision brought on two days of protest over the weekend and shut down a shopping mall. An independent autopsy concluded Clark was shot from behind, but the state's autopsy concluded he was shot from the front. The officers said Clark was coming towards them with what they thought was a gun. In fact, it was a cell phone. His family has filed a $20 million lawsuit against alleging the officers used racial profiling and excessive force. Clark's brother, Stevante Clark, 25, has filed paperwork to raise money to run for the mayor of Sacramento in 2020. Now, this weekend, we also found out that Terrence Crutcher, the cop, a former cop who shot and killed him in Tulsa, Oklahoma, she will not be facing any federal charges by the Department of Justice. Uh, he's got his hands up there for her now. Mike, I'm going to hit the recorder. This guy's still walking. They had following commands. Not for Taser, I think. That's a, got a feeling that's about to happen. That looks like a bad dude, too, to be honest with something. Which way are they facing? Police one, they're facing westbound. Uh, I think he may have just been tasered. Shots fired! Ooh. Uh, 321, we have shots fired. We have one suspect down. We need to end here. Now, former Tulsa cop Betty Shelby was the one who shot and killed Crutcher. You could tell by the video, he was walking slowly, hands up in the air. Now, the cops tasered him before Shelby decided to fire one shot, killing him. A jury acquitted Shelby of any wrongdoing in May of 2017, but the Department of Justice investigated whether Shelby violated Crutcher's civil rights. Now, this is the only way feds can get involved in any police shootings because murder is a state crime, while violating a person's civil rights is a federal crime. Now, we also learned uh, this, this took place, uh, of course, on Friday. The U.S. Attorney for Oklahoma, Trent Shores, said in a statement that after investigations by the Department of Justice's Civil Rights Division, his office, and the FBI, there was insufficient evidence to pursue federal civil rights charges. Now, here's the problem here. First of all, remember when Eric Holder, when he was the attorney uh, for, for the attorney general, one of the things that he said is that it should be changes uh, to uh, lower the threshold. Said it was very it was very difficult for the Department of Justice to pursue many of these cases because of the high standard uh, that was involved. Of course, many people are still shocked uh, and disappointed by this decision. Uh, and of course, the initial uh, shooting itself, especially when you look at, uh, of course, uh, Terrence Crutcher, uh, how he was walking with his hands up. Joining us right now is uh, Terrence uh, Crutcher's uh, sister. Uh, glad to certainly have uh, her on the show, uh, as well as uh, the attorney, Demario, Demario uh, Simmons. Uh, first of all, um, Dr. Terry, th this is, uh, has to be difficult. Again, when you look at that video, and he's, he's walking slowly, his hands are up, and she still fires. 
Uh, absolutely. Um, I had to actually turn away from uh, the video, Roland, when you just played it, because to, to stir up these emotions, uh, it, it's really difficult. Um, and I, I'm just so disappointed about what happened on Friday with the DOJ flying into Tulsa and telling us that they were not going to bring charges because my expectations were a, a lot different uh, and it devastated me. I, I was really low the last few days. So uh, it's been very difficult for my family these past few days. And the, the first of all, were you called ahead of time by the DOJ, by the U.S. attorney, to let you know that they were not going to pursue these charges? No, we were not. Uh, we just got a call saying, hey, uh, we want to meet with you. And uh, they brought in the whole team, the FBI, the U.S. attorney for the state of Oklahoma, and people flew in from the DOJ, our attorneys. And um, they brought us into a conference room at the U.S. attorney's office and shared with us that they went through an extensive investigation, went through the state um, records with a fine tooth comb and just talked about how strict the statue was and why they came up with the decision and they allowed us to ask as many questions as we needed to ask. Um, but again, it was very devastating. Um, Demario, I want to go to you. Uh, again, the family's pursuing uh, that lawsuit. What is the status of that? Well, first of all, Roland, we appreciate you continuing covering this case. You've been there from day one as you are in our community overall. So we thank you for that. We do have a civil rights lawsuit currently pending in the Northern District of Oklahoma. We feel very strong that we will have an opportunity to prove that Betty Shelby did violate Terrence's civil rights. As you stated, the video is very, very clear that Terrence was walking away. His hands was in the air. He was not an imminent threat. He was at a safe distance and Betty Shelby has several officers around her. Unfortunately, our civil case is on what's called a stay, which is basically a pause. Our federal judge has uh, stayed the case as we litigate what's called qualified immunity. So this is an important point because not only do we need to lower the threshold of this, the criminal statute, which is 18 U.S.C. 242, we also need to get rid of this thing called qualified immunity, which is something that's made up by the judges, the judicial branch. It's not in the actual statute, the 1983 statute that we utilize to sue police officers or police departments. But this is basically an impediment that makes it very, very, very difficult uh, to be able to sue these officers. And that's why over 98 percent of these cases are actually lost at the summary judgment stage on qualified immunity. So one of the things that Tiffany and I and uh, Benjamin Crump, uh, my co-counsel and, and mentor, you know, we're looking forward along with Reverend Al, who we talked to yesterday, Reverend Al Sharpton, to come to DC and start lobbying to have the threshold lowered on the criminal side and also for the Congress to do something about eradicating qualified immunity from the civil side. So Demarion, let me ask you this here. Uh, when you talk about uh, you know, what is next? We, we see these over and over. I can't remember the last time DOJ even pursued any civil rights charges against a police officer. Well, the, 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 the only time I can recall in my lifetime and it's the Walter Scott, Walter Scott case out of South Carolina mm -hmm. where Mr. Scott was running from the officer and the officer shot him six or seven times in the back. And I tell you, Roland, I don't think the DOJ would have uh, actually prosecuted that officer if that not, would not have been on video of the officer after shooting Mr. Scott, taking the taser and planting it next to Mr. Scott's dead body. I think that was something that they almost had to bring charges. But beyond that, Tamir Rice, Eric Garner, uh, Jordan Crawford, uh, Mike Brown, the list goes on and on. These cases are never brought because the system beyond the anti-black bias that we know exists in the U.S. justice system, the structure of the law is set up so you can have these very disappointing, but very, um, you know, you know these outcomes are going to come. So you're disappointed, but you're not surprised. You, um, uh, we now know that, of course, Betty Shelby is training other officers how to respond to these situations? Really? That has to be an insult uh, to you and your family. Oh, man. <laughs> you know, just pouring salt on an open wound. And I don't know if everyone knows, Roland, that here recently uh, we just found out that Betty Shelby had a past 
you know, the playbook is to vilify and assassinate the character of, of the victims, uh, but we never delve into the past of police officers. And Betty Shelby had several restraining orders filed against her. Betty Shelby, actually, um, the TPD, the actual agency that hired her, came out to her ex-husband's home and had to do a report titled Assault with a Deadly Weapon. Yet they hired her anyway. She should have never had a gun. Her own children um, took her to court for child abuse. But this, this, this lady was hired by TPD, and they unleashed this killer cop onto our community. But that was never brought up in the criminal trial. And uh, they're saying nothing about it. But it's, it's another shot fired, and it's devastated to know if, if she didn't slide through the cracks, my brother might be alive today. She has a history uh, of violence. And Roland, this is what's really scary to individuals like Betty Shelby. There are so many of them across this country uh, out here patrolling our neighborhoods in particular who should never be police officers. And then when you see an individual like Betty Shelby is able to get a job and work in law enforcement again, when she's shown that she does not have the capacity, the temperament or the skill set to be an officer, to have the power of our government to arrest people, uh, to search people, and unfortunately, as in this case, to shoot and kill people. It is a very scary thought to know that those officers like Betty Shelby are still in our community. And, and can I just jump in and say this? Um, this whole federal statute about um, they have to prove willful intent, that she intentionally intended to kill Terrence, she made it very clear. I don't know if you all saw the 60 Minutes interview, but she stated that he made me do it. And uh, he, you know, I told him to stop and he wouldn't. I can't believe he made me do it and he's responsible for his own death. So, you know, that's what you have to prove. I believe that she said it, you know, she intended to kill him because not complying or not stopping getting on the ground is no reason to shoot someone dead. So it's really frustrating. All right then, well, uh, Dr. Tiffany, I appreciate it. Demario, thanks a bunch as well. We certainly will continue to follow this case uh, and seek justice for Terrence Crutcher. Thank you, Roland. Thank you so much. All right, thanks a bunch, folks. Going to a break. We'll be back. We'll talk about uh, HBCUs and what uh, folks in Congress, which members of Congress, are doing right by HBCUs and those who are not. Plus, Taj Jackson, the nephew of Michael Jackson, uh, is here to respond to the first part of the HB doc HBO documentary, Leaving Neverland. It has the Jackson family angry with HBO and the folks who accuse Michael Jackson of being a pedophile. That is next on Roland Martin Unfiltered. No one can figure out your worth but you. Entertainer Pro Bailey. All right, folks, our hashtag HBCU Giving Day School of the Day is Wiley College, located in Marshall, Texas. Uh, founded in 1873, notable graduates include James Farmer, Henrietta Bell Wells, uh, Heman Marion Sweat, James Wheaton, Thelma DeWitty, and many more. If you want to support Wiley, please go to Wiley, W-I-L-E-Y-C dot E-D-U. That's W-I-L-E-Y-C dot E-D-U. And especially all you Wiley College graduates, because remember, uh, one of the issues that we have is that HBCU you graduates are frankly not giving enough to their schools, so we certainly want you to do that. Uh, and if there's another school that you want to support, uh, please do so by uh, giving and supporting our HBCUs. All right, folks, calling all HBCU alumni, students, and leaders. Enter the Ford Motor Company HBCU Mobility Challenge and win $25,000 for your school. Building on their long-term support of HBCUs, Ford is looking to improve mobility in HBCU communities through innovative solutions. The winning program will receive a grant up to $25,000 to implement their proposal. Now, the deadline to apply is March 31st, 2019. That means y'all got 24 days to apply. Go to fgb.life fgb.life for more information and to apply. Remember, Ford goes further in our community 
And we certainly thank Ford Cares for being a partner here with us at Roland Martin Unfiltered. All right, folks. Uh, now, you know we often talk about historically black colleges and universities uh, and how critically important they are. The UNCF now has created a scorecard uh, to be able to, so you can see how senators, your senators, and members of Congress are supporting HBCUs. Joining us right now to talk about this scorecard is Michael Lomax. He's the president of the United Negro College Fund. Dr. Lomax, glad to have you here. It's great to be with you, Roland. So Martin. let's talk scorecard. So, uh, let's talk scorecard. Uh, so, hey, I just want to say one thing. Yes. You said all those wonderful things about Wiley College, and you didn't say Melvin B. Tolson and the home of the great debaters. Well, put put that on uh, Chelsea. Yeah. Chelsea, you the one. Didn't you uh, put put together the HBCU thing? Yes. Okay, blame Chelsea for that. Hey, she screwed it up. Just remember Melvin B. Tolson, who brought debating right. to Wiley College. Yep. And then that's the home of the great debaters. Another reason for it to be the school of the day. Oh, I, I got okay, you. I'm I got sorry. you. Thank Chelsea, you screwed up. <laughs> Damn it. All right. <laughs> so you lucky I ain't say put the camera on you. All right, then. Uh, so, scorecard. Um, why did y'all want to do this? You know, uh, you know, in politics and in life, everybody says they're your friend. Everybody says they believe in you and they support you. But, you know, there are those who actually stand with you in times of need and assist you in real palpable ways. And we believe that, uh, first of all, we've had such a great two years uh, in Washington because of the active, incredible support that we've gotten from a couple of members, a, a number of members of Congress. Mm -hmm. And we just felt like it was time for UNCF to do something that nobody else has done, and that is actually to make a list of the people who have made a difference for HBCUs, who's helped us get over $100 million out well, well, of well, well, Not, not just make a difference, but also to show those who have not. And well, so the purpose yeah, of scorecards right. is to be able to say, okay, on the initiatives that you care yeah. about, where do members rank? Yes. So who gets top grades? Well, let me just say, the, the top, top group, composed of now 55 individuals okay is the congressional black caucus all right and uh without the congressional black caucus uh, hbcus would not have the level of support that they have enjoyed historically and that we've had now this is the scorecard life. right here this is the no this, this one the, no this is what we were going to base the scorecard on this okay one, this is the things we were seeking all right in the 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 last Congress. So this is the so this is the honor roll. Yes, that is so, the so honor roll. So did you put grades, or what? What did you do? No, now you know we introduced this initially by creating an honor roll. These are the individuals. Give me my honor roll back. Well, who are the folks who <laughs> failed? I need the folks uh, no, who I, failed. Oh no, no 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 no! You just I'm the guest here. No, <laughs> you got a scorecard. No, I mean look, it's, look. You if somebody in your class ain't doing right. Uh, they get an F. Now, I don't, let's, let, can, can we begin by accentuating the positive? Right, that's the A's. <laughs> that's now, the A's. And, and let me tell you, let me just tell you the basis upon which, and, and let me just tell you, you are not, I am the teacher, you are the student. No, <laughs> uh, uh, no, remember, you might be the teacher, I'm the, I'm the principal. All right, all right. <laughs> <laughs> all right, get out of here. Uh -huh. All right, so, but... You know, this is, these are the people, and you know the difference. These are the people who, when you said, we need a letter circulated, mm -hmm. uh, you signed your name on that letter right. supporting a piece of legislation. These are the individuals who made speeches on the floor. Okay. Or before committees. Uh, these are the people who joined the bipartisan HBCU caucus okay. and worked with Alma Adams mm -hmm. to make sure that we got matters through. And these are the people who truly served as the champions to help us get an increase in funding for HBCUs, uh, to increase services to low-income students mm -hmm. who worked in behalf of those pieces of legislation, and importantly, people who worked in behalf of the, the first criminal justice legislation that we've seen come through the Congress. So your scorecard is not like the NAACP scorecard, where they actually do grades for each member based upon the legislation? Well, we felt that it was important, first of all, to begin to introduce the notion that, that we are, in fact, going to give information and give recognition to people who have achieved in behalf of HBCUs. And we also felt that in, in the initial uh, report that we would give, we wanted to do this qualitatively. We mm -hmm. wanted to be able to say 
These are the kinds of things that people did, and this is what we held them accountable for. Uh, in future years, as we get clarity and precision ar around how we will award m numerical uh, n numbers, then we, we may introduce the numerical as well. But I also just want to say on this, uh, passing legislation, uh, getting appropriations, uh, is a complicated process. It involves a lot mm -hmm. of steps. And, you know, we have, we have people who are on this list who managed to get something through a committee but may not have voted for the full legislation on the floor. They got it where it needed to be, but because there was something wrong in the legislation on principle, they couldn't vote for all the other, you know, all the other things, the poison pills that mm -hmm. were in it. So we're, we want to, before we introduce numerics, uh, we want to be absolutely certain that we have agreement that not only on what should be uh, evaluated numerically, but that the people who are going to be evaluated, who have been, who have demonstrated their support, believe that we're doing it accurately. Because w the, the worst thing to do is to put out false information, to put out misinformation, to put out partial, partial information. We're not going to do that. So where can folks see the scorecard? Where can folks see the scorecard? They can go to the UNCF. Uh, they can go to uncf.org. What do you call it? Hashtag. Right. Uh, no, it's... No, slash. Backslash. backslash. Uh, HBCU scorecard. You go to that, and you will not only see the individual names, you'll see the photographs of the members. Mm -hmm. You'll see... Uh, and you'll, see, you'll, you'll learn more about them. And then, not only will you see that, but in a couple of weeks, you will have a page for each of those members. And there'll be more detailed information about the support that they're providing to UNCF. All right. Sounds good. All right. Well, we appreciate it. Thanks for coming, coming, dropping by, giving us the information on the scorecard. And, and let me just say, this is this is very consequential, mm -hmm. and so that your your viewers are now going to know who stood with Bennett College, who stood with Payne, on uh, who stood with all HBCUs on getting additional funding, who stood with low income students and helped us get more Pell funding, and tomorrow. So on that list, who stood, but. Who didn't stand? Well, you know, brother, if you're not on the list, you must not have been. No, I'm just, I want to be sure because, again, though, people, there are people who are single issue candidates. And so yes. being able to judge candidates based upon this issue or others, I think is critically important. Well, you, you know, we are providing the information. We, we're getting there. We, we, we may, we're going to probably get more detailed as we go forward. But, you know, you don't... They're those details I want to see. Well, yeah, all right. All no, because, because here's the piece. In, in, Randall Robinson's, in Randall Robinson's book, The Debt, uh, he talked... Maynard Jackson had... Uh, Maynard Jackson had, which you, who you knew very well... And I knew Randall had, Robinson had, had, very had, well. And first of all, Randall's still here, so yeah, it, yeah. we can't talk past yeah, tense. Yeah. Uh, well, and, I knew him. And, and, and Maynard Robert Jackson Kelly. had this idea of a card. Yeah. And that would be two-sided that would be distributed to black America and say, here are the various issues. And so whenever we would encounter a politician, it would be, okay, where do you stand on this? Yeah. I think it is important for us, uh, whether they are Democrat or Republican, yeah. whether they are white, black, Asian, Latino, does not matter, uh, for folks to realize that, wait a minute, that's my member of Congress, that's my senator, to be able to say, hey, did you, where do you stand yeah. on these issues? Yeah. And being able to have that, so for instance, I'm born and raised in Texas, I still vote there, I want to know exactly yeah. where Senator Ted Cruz and where Senator John Cornyn stand, so when I roll up on them, I'm, my deal would be like, yo, what the hell? Uh, how are you supporting TSU and Prairie View and Wiley? And so, and, and, and that's why I'm saying that, and then if somebody is doing well and they got an A, hey, Appreciate you standing yeah. for HBCUs. Yeah. And uh, for, first, let me just say, I know Randall, I knew Max, and so I, I Robinson. So I'm a little confused. Wasn't expecting to hear those names. You know, I worked, I worked for and with Maynard, mm -hmm. uh, and learned uh, a great deal from him. Maynard was a powerful elected official, and you know he was unequivocal in his approach. Uh, we are a nonprofit. Nonpartisan 501c3. So right. we are going to be quite careful that everything that we do is within the bounds of a, yeah. of a nonprofit. So but you can still be a 501c3 yeah, well, yeah, but, and you know, say, here's a bill who supported and who didn't. That, that's just a fact. Well, that's, but, not, uh, all right. well, that's not I, partisan. I, I, I understand that the perfect may on occasion be the enemy of the good. I think that our honor roll 
is a very good first step on telling the story and putting on paper who are the people mm -hmm. who are supporting HBCUs. And it's going to be, I hope, a uh, clarion call to all members of Congress that they have an opportunity to be on the HBCU honor roll right. next year. And those year. who are not on that list need to be jacked up. <laughs> See, he wants an NRA type list. Yeah, yeah. He wants to see the but, F. But, yeah, yeah. No, 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 no. I want to, no, no. I go back to, to in, in early 2000s when I covered, when the NAACP did their scorecards. Yeah. When I, they would they go to their convention, they would announce their scorecards for the automotive industry, for the hotel industry. And I, re, I remember that there were people in the hotel industry who said, Yo, we had a C last year. We want to be in the A's and yeah. B's. Uh, just remember, and, we're talking now not about industries. We're talking about elected officials. Yes, the folks who we vote and for. And I also recall that there were occasions, there was one occasion when uh, there were challenges to and, and people raising issues about whether the NAACP had gone outside of its nonprofit says we're not going to put ours at risk. Well, they didn't. They didn't, but they took a lot of grief. You know, yeah, but that, that. But you know, sometimes you got to call some folk well, out I mean, in yeah, order to get gonna, their We're going to let you be our media yes, leader. That's why I want the grant. And I'm going to be our I want to know, but fundraising. I, I want to know. You can do all the fundraising you want to. Friends, he can make. I'm trying ACC. to get you more money. All right. Well, so I want to know who got F's who got D's and who got C's, so we can call them out to move them to the A's and B's. Well, I, I move them, my brother. But I got to know who got F's first. <laughs> and so I need to see who that scorecard, who got F. So this is the first one. That's nice. Yeah. Honor roll. Yeah. That's great. But just like when you go to school, they put the honor roll people on the wall. They say all this sort of stuff. But in the classroom, they're like, your ass got an F. And so you ain't trying to be in the F category because you don't want to get left behind. And so now you look at your classmates in the fifth grade and you back in the fourth grade. Yeah, I know. Well, you know, I will say this. <laughs> I've just never, I, 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 I have known Roland Martin for lo these many years, and I have never met his goals entirely, but I'm, I'm, a, I'm working toward That's it. That's right. Just like Maya Angelou said, she says, I would never call myself a Christian because I'm constantly aspiring to get to that point. And so my point is, if they ain't supporting HBCUs, we got to call them out. Just like I'm calling North Carolina out, and I'm talking to you, uh, Tillis uh, and Barr as well, how they split North Carolina a and in the three con congressional districts. How are you going to split the largest HBCU on campus in the three districts because they scared their voting power those students in North Carolina a and So I'm just saying. That's just a fact. You're just saying. Just a fact. Just a fact. All right, Doc. All right, brother. I want to see them Fs and them Ds. All right. <laughs> we appreciate it, y'all. Check out the USCF scorecard. And don't forget to support your uh, favorite uh, UNCF school and HBCU because some of them are also uh, public as well. And also PBIs like Chicago State. Uh, so it's all about getting our kids educated. A amen to that. All right. Thanks a bunch, Doc. Thank you. All right, folks, now let's talk about, man, of course, uh, last night, uh, a lot of people were tuning in to HBO uh, for the first part of the two-part series, folk docu-series, focusing on uh, Michael Jackson, allegations of pedophilia. Man, social media was up in an uproar last night. They, they got mad with me even asking a question, are y'all going to watch? Here is clips from the docu-series. Everybody wanted to meet Michael or be with Michael. And then he likes you. I was seven years old. Michael asked, do you and the family want to come to Neverland? We drive in and forget about all your problems. You were in Neverland. It was a fantasy. The days were filled with magical childhood adventure experiences playing tag, watching movies, eating junk food, anything you could ever want as a child. It's like hanging out with a friend that's more your age. Just kid things. They were just doing kid things. He just came across as a loving, caring, kind soul. It was easy to believe that he was just that. Out of a storybook, right? Out of a fairy tale. Hello, Wade. Today is your birthday. So congratulations. I love you. Goodbye. There's no thoughts of this is wrong or anything like that. He told me if they ever found out what we were doing, 
he and I would go to jail for the rest of our lives. Secrets will eat you up. You feel so alone. I want to be able to speak the truth as loud as I had to speak the lie for so long. All right, folks, part two premieres tonight with Oprah Winfrey sitting down with the accusers and the filmmaker Dan Reed immediately after to discuss how this has impacted their lives. She's even getting lots of criticism uh, for saying it's time to essentially cancel Michael Jackson. Joining us right now is Taj Jackson. Taj is the nephew of Michael Jackson, also the son of Tito Jackson. He, uh, so, Taj, you're from the, in the UK right now. Certainly welcome to Roller Martin Unfiltered. Um, Many, a lot of people, a lot of people are disturbed by mm-hmm. what they heard in this documentary. Uh, folks have said no grown man should have been sleeping with kids, uh, should not have been around kids. Um, and, and so uh, how is the Jackson family dealing uh, with, uh, with this documentary and bringing up again the allegations that have been leveled against Michael Jackson, even though he was previously found not guilty? It's been really hard. It's, um, you know, we don't feel like we have a platform, so I do appreciate you um, letting me do this. Uh, I feel like I'm, we're screaming to the wall in a way, and I, for me, it's it's really frustrating because I I know Wade very well, and I know what he's doing. I know his agenda, you know, I, and I see through it. Just like you can see people that you know, and and you see them on TV. I have a couple of friends on reality shows right now that I can't watch because I know they're acting. Well, that's what this felt like. And uh, uh, there have been a number of people who say, first of all, that these, these gentlemen testified in Michael's trial saying that he did not do these things. Now they say uh, he did do as these things. As an adult. Things. They testified as an adult. Mm-hmm. Oh, yeah. I, I'm sorry. Because no, 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 I no, just watched. No, no go ahead. Go ahead. Go he ahead. It sound like he testified. Yeah, he made it sound like he testified as a kid. He te- testified as a grown adult, claiming that he didn't know things were wrong at that point. When the um, the not only the DA was after him, my uncle, but was trying to nail him on anything. He asked repeatedly, "Did Michael touch you here? Did Michael touch you there?" You know, and it takes it. Here's the thing: Wade Robson was the first defense um, witness on the stand. Do you think if my uncle molested him for seven years, he'd put him on the stand as his first witness? I mean, that's the dumbest thing you could possibly do in front of all those sheriffs and all those people. So, so you're, say, you're saying place he could be. you're saying Wade was a witness for Michael Jackson and not the prosecution? He was the first defense witness, the very first defense witness. Uh, through all the cross-examination, he, he was very firm and very, very truthful. Now, because... He got kicked out of Cirque du Soleil. He wanted to be the head choreographer for MJ1. He was praising them all the way up to that point. All the, You can watch any clips from YouTube and whatever. The reason why we're mad is because it's a timeline thing. He's up there praising him. He's dancing behind Janet Jackson at the VMAs, you know, talking about how in, inspirational Michael Jackson was. But then all of a sudden he doesn't get the MJ1 job, and then he starts writing a book about sexual abuse. So that's it. I mean, that's not that's not me saying that. That's fact. And he secretly writes it. No publisher would publish it. So then he tries to sue the estate under seal, and they say no, you, we're not suing. You can't do that. And so he has to come public with it. So that's why we feel back backstabbed because I really honestly feel that if he would have got that MJ one job, we would not be here. You also, of course, uh, have HBO saying that they were not going to uh, acquiesce to the Jackson family. The Southern Christian Leadership Conference, uh, they sent a letter to HBCO blasting them for their decision as well. Uh, President Charles Steele uh, also highly criticized them. Um, other people have said that this documentary is unfair because it is extremely one-sided. Uh, was, were any members of the Jackson family given an opportunity to respond to the filmmakers? No, and, and the director even said that. He said that would have interfered with his storytelling. He didn't even give Brett Barnes, who's mentioned in the, in the movie, his name smeared in the movie because it's implied that he, that he replaced one of them as one of the kids. And Brett's a private citizen in Australia. He's actually looking into legal recourse right now. He said to, 
he sent a demand letter to both HBO and the production company, and they basically gave him the middle finger. So, at, you know, that's what that's what's not being reported. And so we're getting frustrated because there's an agenda in the media to make this. First of all, Michael Jackson, when Michael Jackson's name comes up, it sells. But when Michael Jackson's names come up with child mol- molestation, it sells even better because negativity sells. And so when you um, look at... Uh, this conversation that Oprah is going to have later um, with uh, the two individuals in the filmmaker, also the stories in, in the magazine. Uh, has anyone from the family reached out to her to say, oh, what are you doing? You know, that, that's, I think, the, the, the hard thing about it. You know, we, we were dealing with this as a family, and then you hear stories of how she's on Geffen, um, David Geffen's boat watching this on her birthday. You know, and it's really... You know, Oprah was one of the first interviews uh, when my uncle passed that my grandma and the kids allowed. Mm -hmm. And, you know, she didn't give us that same respect. And that's that's what's so frustrating. You know, when you have a one sided documentary, at least you can get the other side. And she didn't even want to do that. And me, I'm, I'm a sexual abuse victim myself, not on my not from my uncle, but from another uncle on my mom's side. And so. I have a great perspective. I've, I've reached out to people and no one wants to hear it. So it's very frustrating. The, what is next? Obviously, the family, I believe, um, about a $100 million lawsuit against these filmmakers. Um, what do you do now? Because obviously, your uncle Michael is dead. He can't defend himself. Yeah. Uh, you have the estate uh, there as well. Uh, and so it really is left to uh, his surviving family members uh, to carry his torch and defend his name and honor. Yeah. Yeah, definitely. I just wanted to say one thing. Um, is the family's not filing suit. We actually have no legal recourse. Okay. Um, you can't defame the dead. You can't slander the dead. You can't libel the dead. Um, it's the Jackson estate, which okay. um, is from my uncle's kids. So we don't get anything. We don't get anything out of anything. You know, I'm just protecting my uncle's name because I know who he was. And so that, um, cause I, I saw a couple articles that, um, misrepresented that and I think that's been going around you know in that way and so I wanted to kind of stop that now family's not getting anything out of this um when you last question uh when you think about yeah uh, the future when you think about uh legacy when you think about um Mm -hmm. uh, what happens 10 20 30 40 50 years from now uh, are you and others uh afraid that when the name Michael Jackson is mentioned. Folks will not say one of the greatest entertainers ever, the king of pop. They will say Michael Jackson, pedophile. No, because I I do believe that the truth will come out. I do. It might take longer than we expected, but the truth is out there and and it will come out. I mean, there's already people, you know, coming out and and, um, basically spilling some tea on Wade because Wade's not as innocent as he pretends to be. Taj Jackson, we appreciate you joining us at Roller Martin Unfiltered. Thanks a bunch. Roland, I really appreciate it, man. I thank really appreciate it. Thank you very thank much. You. All right. Go to our panel here. Avis Jones, the Weaver, leadership strategist, author of uh, How Black, Black, Exceptional Black Women Lead. Also, Michael Brown, of course, uh, uh, Democratic analyst as well. Um, I did, have not seen Leaving Neverland. I was in Selma this weekend. My multiple flight delays, I didn't get to my house until 3.30 this morning. Uh, so I have not seen it. Uh, Michael, you've seen it. Uh, Avis, have you seen it? I have not seen it. Uh, Michael, I'll start with you then. Um, you saw part one. You heard Taj Jackson. Your thoughts? Well, um, my heart, you know, clearly goes out to the family. No one should have to go through something like this without a level of fairness or a level playing field. <clears throat> clearly, in, in America, people can do documentaries. But just seem to, if you look at the R. Kelly one, they had psychiatrists, they had other people giving other sides of the story. And this one is just absolutely one-sided. They literally just talk to the men and their families. That's it. That's all they talked to. So I thought there was a level of unfairness um, that, that accompanied this particular documentary. But clearly some of the facts in there were just awful. It was terrible. And um, I was sorry to hear that. I mean, most people, certainly in my age group... Well, well not some of the facts that were offered. Some of the allegations, allegations that were offered, correct. because again, Michael Jackson Avis was found not guilty when he went to court. Mm-hmm. Yes, you have the settlement with with another gentleman, <clears throat> some twenty three million dollars uh, as well, uh, but a settlement is not an admission of guilt. Mm-hmm. Uh, 
what, what do you make, though, when you hear the Jackson family and then you see Oprah's involvement in the interviews and the old magazine and then you have people who are saying, oh, absolutely, I'm going to stop listening to his music. Uh, he's a pedophile. You know, I feel, I do feel for the family because I, you know, it does seem easy. It's easy uh, to defame someone who's dead, who's to bring up allegations and form a sort of one-sided argument against someone who cannot defend themselves. Uh, once again, I have not seen uh, the documentary, but to me, if you're on a fact-finding mission, you would look to see both sides of the story and let the viewer be able to determine what makes sense, what sounds factual to you. If, on the other hand, you are presenting information only in a one-sided way, that to me suggests that there is an agenda there. And particularly with what we just learned in terms of what may be some sort of motivations behind a sort of change in um, attitude around this issue following employment problems or, or not getting a key job, you know, maybe that's some sort of motivation. I don't know. Um, but it is sort of disturbing to me that there was not any care, it sounds like, putting into creating a more well-rounded presentation uh, so that we could more, uh, so that we could have some more confidence that we are really finding out facts rather than watching some sort of uh, specific character assassination. Uh, I want to go to Eugene Craig, who's joining us via Skype Republican Strategies. Eugene, you've seen uh, both parts of the documentary. Uh, you want to get your initial take uh, on what you saw. Yeah, I wasted four hours of my life watching both both of those uh, both parts of it. Um, it's a completely one-sided documentary. Um, it has the uh, likeness of a four-hour smear ad uh, campaign, essentially. Um, I don't understand how you can go on a fact-finding mission or be concerned about telling a story and not tell complete parts of the story. Um, I mean, one thing that's been consistent in every single legitimate or uh, story with legitimate allegations uh, of child molestation uh, when it comes to celebrities is that there's always a defector from the from the camp. I mean, they had not one person from the Jackson camp that could you know verify that some of these things happened. Um, you know, so it was, it was a horrible documentary. You know, I can't believe HBO wasted their airtime with it. Um, I can't believe HBO put themselves at liability with it. Um, you know, there's a reason why, you know, publishers went and touched the book. You know, there's a reason why, you know, you know, most other companies went and touched this particular documentary. Um, and, and the thing is, and, and the interesting thing about it is that this, you know, Wade was willing to sell his, uh, is access essentially to Michael Jackson and the time he spent Michael Jackson, you know, you know, leveraging it to become an instincts choreographer and Britney Spears is choreographer. Um, and then as Todd said, the second he didn't get the job with MJ one, you know, now we have the situation here. Um, but I watched both parts of the documentaries, you know, four hours wasted of my time. Got um, it. And, and shame on Oprah. Yeah. You know, I think we know, there should be a conversation about canceling Michael Jackson. There should be a conversation about canceling Oprah Winfrey. I want to ask you all um, about this here. The, the, the sit-down discussion she's going to be leading later tonight. I'm going to ask you this here. Pros, uh, Mitchell sent this tweet out. Other people did this well. Michael, can go to my iPad. Michael Jackson was under FBI surveillance for well over a decade. Uh, you don't see it. I don't understand why, but I'll try to replug it up. Um, how about now? Do you see it? Okay, uh, I'll just go ahead and read. I'm not sure why it's not showing up. Okay. Michael Jackson was under FBI surveillance for well over a decade. They found nothing to substantiate claims of child abuse. He was also fully exonerated following his 05 trial. Leaving Neverland fails to highlight these facts, and MJ is no longer here to defend himself. Now, what's also interesting is he sent this tweet. He said, last month, Elvis Presley received an all-star tribute to his life and career on NBC, all while his history of drugging and sleeping with underage girls was well known. Avis, mm -hmm. your thoughts on those two, <laughs> especially the uh, Elvis one. Well, you know, once again. You know how white folks feel about Elvis? Uh, oh, Lord have mercy, for real. Don't do nothing about Elvis. Don't say nothing bad about Elvis. Uh, I'm not surprised, and that's true. I mean, when he met his his wife, she was, what, 14 or 13? something? So, yeah, we know about that. Um, and they don't care. They're very selective uh, when it comes to those types of things. But I did not know about this, what was decade-long FBI surveillance? I mean, to me, that is that is a very important fact. That's a that's a key fact that suggests that if there was anything, because we all remember that time. We remember that time when uh, there was a lot of pressure on Michael Jackson. If he was under FBI surveillance, trust and believe that there was something there to be found, they would have moved on it. It's my belief. Michael, 
and it would have leaked. Yeah. Um, and that was the first I've heard. I, I didn't even know. What year was that, Roland? When was that? What time? Uh, was that was, uh, first of all, in 2009, the FBI released their Michael Jackson FBI file. Uh, wow. Folks, if you actually go to vault. Actually, let me pull it up right here. Here we go to my iPad. If you go to vault.fbi.gov, you will actually see uh, the FBI files there uh, on Michael Jackson. And so you'll see uh, what they have here. Uh, and I'm going to read this here. Michael Jackson, 1950 to 2009, was a famous singer and entertainer. Between 1993 and 1994 and separately between 2004 and 2005, Jackson was investigated by California law enforcement agencies for possible child molestation. He was acquitted of all such charges. The FBI provided technical and investigative assistance to these agencies during the cases. The Bureau also investigated threats made against Mr. Jackson and others by an individual who was later in prison for these crimes. These investigations occurred between 92 and 2005. So folks, when they say 10 years, they mean, they, 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 clearly they're talking about the threats, but they, they were involved in those the previous uh, in terms of those two cases. Mm -hmm. uh, now, I'm going to pull up something here because Vanity Fair did a story where they said that, uh, that, that there were fingerprints that were found on pornographic material in Michael Jackson's bedroom where his fingerprints... Uh, and the fingerprints of, ch of, of children were right next to each other mm. on this mag on these on this um, uh, on these magazines. Michael, then Eugene. Well, and, and then back to that second tweet related to Elvis. Um, yeah, absolutely. All the rumors and fact about him um, dating and marrying underage girls and taking them across state line, but also about all the music from African Americans that he stole. Yeah. So that, I mean, there's several pieces. It just makes this whole thing unfair when you're talking about music icons. But clearly, uh, we still live in America. Eugene? Yeah, the thing is this, right? Part of the investigation with threats made about Michael Jackson was him being having to allow the FBI to some degree into his life. To oh, also, let me say this, oh, let me say this here. Also, the documents, I'll tell you my radar online, they have absolutely horrible credibility on anything that they report. They get more stuff yeah. wrong than I've ever seen in my life. Eugene, go ahead. <laughs> and so the thing is this, right? So you have two FBI investigations, and particularly with this particular case, you have a gentleman who, you know, I think if, if you know, we're having discussions about law enforcement, he should be, if, if, if he's going to this documentary and saying that he, you know, essentially purging himself not once but twice, bring charge, bring perjury charges up. Send him to jail. It. Send him to jail. Let him, let him get in the stand and say, yeah, I perjured myself, and then present evidence to support that. But the thing is this, um, you, know, op you know, Oprah should be shaming herself for giving these to a platform, because the issue is this. The documentary by, documented by itself is illegitimate. Got it. Her lending her name to the story starts to legitimize it. That's it. All right, then. All right, well, never, Leaving Neverland Part 2 airs tonight, and so we'll see what the fallout's going to be tomorrow. Let's talk a little politics Former Attorney General Eric Holder announced today he is not running for president, but in an opinion piece published in the Washington Post, he wrote that he would focus on stopping the gerrymandering that disenfranchises certain citizens and added, quote, we must restore the core of our democracy and protect voting rights. There's nothing more fundamental to the well-being of our nation than the right to cast a ballot in fair elections, free from foreign interference. The Republican Party has used voter ID laws, gerrymandering, and purging of the voters' rolls to undermine that right while doing nothing to protect our electoral system from another foreign attack. We must reconstruct the Voting Rights Act to ensure that every American has a full and equal say in our democracy. This is a defining civil rights issue of our time. Now, today, uh, The Breakfast Club, they aired uh, an interview they did with Senator Bernie Sanders. Of course, he is officially running for president. Uh, he, <laughs> he, of course, filed as a Democrat, but he also filed to seek his Senate uh, position as an independent, which is causing Democrats to say, like, dude, what the hell? Over the weekend, he announced uh, from his hometown of Brooklyn, uh, about uh, 13,000 folks were there. Uh, to, uh, of course, uh, help him out, of course, but he needs, of course, black folks if he wants to win this nomination. And so he went on The Breakfast Club, and Charlemagne the God asked this key before. All right. What'd y'all think? Where's the agenda? It, it sounded like 
end of rambling. I mean, he brought, he brought up real issues. He talked about the wealth disparity. He talked about financial services industry. But I don't see any specifically specific policy proposals, although I have to tell you that's not surprising to me because he spent nearly 30 years in Congress without passing for specific policies. So my, my, my challenge with him is that he, he comes up with, you know, he, he says things that resonates with people because they're based in truth. But if you look at his history of actually producing legislation and leading legislation that has led to change on anything, it's a very, 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 very thin record. Uh, Michael, that was one of the things that when Car Congresswoman Karen Bass, the chair of the CBC, was here, she actually said it. She said, okay, where are the bills? What has he done? What has he advanced? It's an interesting question, and, and that's why he was struggling to answer. And it's a little odd. You're run Obviously, you're running for office. You're going on an African-American show. Seem, you know you're going to get that question. It seems, seems like you'd be more prepared at least to run down. Even if you didn't write the laws, you can say what you voted for. Um, <laughs> he didn't even do that. So he's, he's struggling, and, clear, and it's going to be different. The table before with Senator Sanders and Hillary, you know, made it, you had a clear choice. Now you have other people that are going to pull from that supposed base that Bernie Sanders has. So I don't know how formidable he'll be. He's not going to be the Democratic nominee. But, uh, Eugene, here is also the difference. Uh, you've had the former Colorado governor who announced today he's running for president. You might have literally four or five more people run. It could be anywhere from 15 to 18 people, which means a Democratic primary could look like the Republicans in 2016. Remember, mm -hmm. Donald Trump did not need 51 percent to win the <clears> primaries. <throat> Uh, wh whoever is able to win, frankly, 30, with this many candidates, you pick up 30%, mm, 32, 35, you win. Yeah. Um, yeah, I, I agree 100% with you. I actually have a, a new theory that's developing. I think Joe Biden's going to get in, but I think the reason he runs is not to be president of the United States. I think the reason he runs is to block Bernie Sanders. Um, you know, think of this. Bernie doesn't have a black agenda, which is wild, which is crazy, being that he spent the last three or four years running for president. Um, you would think that this, you know, entering this race, he would have a well-defined black agenda. Um, you know, and I also don't think it's a coincidence, it's a coincidence that, he's re that he's filed for re-election. He also expects that he's not going to be the Democrat nominee and probably will be forced to drop out eventually. And we'll have to uh, turn around and, um, and, and run for re-election. Um, but yes, I do agree that, you know, the you're, you're going to have a situation where the person is not going to need the 20, you know, the 50 percent, 40, 50 percent, and it's not going to be a replay of 2016 where it's one on one between him and Clinton. Um, you know, so what you, you know, what you're going to see is, you know, people win primaries with 25, 30 um, percent, and and you know, Bernie may be somewhat banking on that. But I also have a question of, hey, you know, where does he get his first initial win? Maybe New Hampshire, but if Biden is in a race, that's also a blocker for him. I think, you know, after California and Texas on Super Tuesday. You know, Kamala has this as a runaway. Look, I think that when you look at this, all first right. of all, um, supporters of Bernie Sanders will say, absolutely, he's got that agenda. Uh, this weekend, uh, Nina Turner, who's co-chair of his campaign, she was one of the folks who spoke at his rally. Sean King, uh, activist, he also spoke at the rally talking about uh, Bernie Sanders, his, uh, his background uh, and his history. Uh, and uh, uh, Yank Uger did a video this weekend where he was highly critical of Bakari Sellers, a commentator on CNN, uh, for saying that uh, the ship is sailed on Bernie Sanders uh, getting uh, the black vote. The reality is this here, and we are in, we're in early March, it's March 4th. Um, you're not going to see many candidates, and people got mad when I said this about Senator Kamala Harris, but these are also people who don't understand a damn thing about politics, right. okay? Okay, so let me say it again. All the people who go, oh, where's this, this plan, this plan, this plan, Beyond just African Americans, you're not going to see candidates throwing out plans right now because first, and again, let me educate those who don't know a damn thing about politics. First of all, you don't know who's all running. True. The field has not been set. I'm going to use uh, sports for a reason. When teams put together game plans, okay, when they have a game plan, what those very teams do is they want to see who's going to be the starting quarterback this Sunday because their game plan is who do you prepare for? Now, if there's an uncertainty, they prepare for two. Well, the reality is you prepare for one. So that's, that's the first thing. So the field hasn't been set. You're not going to see uh, extensive plans, white papers, whatever you want to call them, 
from these candidates because of that. Two, the first debate, I believe, I saw something about June mm. but or July. So you're not going to see anybody really get specific because right now you're in the stage of I'm trying to get people to know who I am. I read a story in Politico and it was like, oh, Kamala Harris, she's out there. And so, you know, so she should be, she, she should be, she should be uh, specific. Um, and all, uh, uh, Amy Klobuchar, oh my goodness, her former staff member say she was like a, a terror. You're in the stage of people who are not known entities. Right. Bernie Sanders is different because he ran for president in 2016. Mm -hmm. He ran across the country. His name ID is a lot higher. And so I think what's going to happen is you're going to see all these candidates talk in general, not offer specifics, and then once the field gets set, once we know if O'Rourke is running, once we know if Biden is running, once we know if Senator Sherrod Brown is running, and then all of a sudden, right before that debate, then it's going to be, okay, now it's game on. Mm -hmm. Michael, that is, I think, how this thing is going to play out, and you're seeing it right now. It's absolutely correct, and I think what you'll see, it'll be interesting to see how um, this is where the chairman of the party really can play a role. Now, it's diminished a lot when my father was chair back then in the Lee Atwater for the RNC, my father for the DNC, those were really strong chairs. If you remember back in 88, there were a whole lot of people running. Rockefeller, yep. Yep. Um, Senator Harkin, Gephardt, people all over the place. Clinton, obviously. Gore, yeah, a lot of folks. Um, and the chairman at the time said, you know what? We're going to get you through maybe late spring, and then we're cutting everybody, and we're going to pick who it is. And that's what he did. He said Bill Clinton's going to beat Bush. And he made the decision. Whether whether Chairman Perez or not will be able to do that, I don't know. It certainly didn't happen on the Republican no, side. No, no, Trump just beat him to death in 16. No, no, it's, it's not going to happen. <laughs> first of, <laughs> first of all, Avis, it's not going to happen because uh, Tom Perez is scared to death yeah. of any criticism of putting his thumb on the scale. He's yeah. going to allow this thing to play out. The, key, the thing that's going to be interesting, though, is what Senator Chuck Schumer does. As I saw a piece today in the New York Times, because here's the piece. The Democrats have a very good shot at taking back the Senate, mm -hmm. but they need strong candidates. Yeah. You've got folks, like, for instance, the, the governor of Montana, I ain't never heard of him, y'all, okay? <laughs> it, he, he really, really believes that he should run for president. <laughs> and according to the New York Times story, his wife has said, I'm not interested in moving, moving to D.C. unless you're president. They're like, dude, run for the United States Senate. Yeah. And so... Schumer is going to be in a position of calling people saying, you know your ass can't win. Right. So I don't know why you're still running. Because, look, between now, when those debates come up, and then you start getting to August, September, October, November, you're going to have early voting in California, Iowa caucus. Look, if you're down at the bottom, and you're, and you're down there at 1%, 2%, half a percent, <laughs> you might need to get the hell out of the race uh, in turn, instead of taking, taking up space, and if there are people who actually can be better Senate candidates, you want strong Senate candidates. I, absolutely. I mean, whoever, you know, if hopefully the Democrats win, it would make such a huge difference if they also had a Senate that they could work with, right? Mm -hmm. And so this is an important goal. Um, but I am concerned, as you mentioned, I don't know that Tom Perez has the strength uh, as a leader to really go out there yeah, we, and do what needs to be done, particularly with the whole sort of Bernie bro atmosphere around, oh, my God, we were so wrong last time. Uh, and the fact, and let's also be real about this, I really also believe uh, that the, the Russian interference is out there, not just generally. I oh, yeah. Oh, it, is that, specifically, it is specifically oh, yeah. tuned into helping the Bernie camp. So let's just, this is a challenge that the Democratic Party has to uh, sort of live up to and acknowledge and be willing to speak out loud. This is very simple, Eugene. This is the last uh, point before I go to a break. This is very simple. From a Democratic standpoint, first of all, people need to stop assuming Trump is going to lose. He's the incumbent. He's going to have the advantage of being the incumbent. Mm -hmm. Republicans are going to, going to solidify uh, around him because they like power. That's what you're going to see. The question is going to be, are you going to have those same Democrats who voted for Obama continue voting for Trump? Are you going to have white women wake the hell up and realize, oh my God, <laughs> we screwed up in 2016? Yeah. Are you going to have independents who, who are going towards him? 
But I got to say this here. These black people who are not blexic, who I see on Twitter and on YouTube and Facebook and Periscope saying some of the most dumbass stuff I've ever heard in my life uh, by saying, well, I'm fine for another four years of Trump. They have no idea <laughs> what he is doing to the federal bench. They have no idea that when you talk about filing a lawsuit and based upon who that judge is, you're not going to have a shot. If you're pissed off at our lead story, Stephon Clark, as well as Terrence Crutcher, guess what? It's a Trump Department of Justice. Mm -hmm. And so yep. I'm just, so again, all these folks who are saying that, they don't know a damn thing about politics because the nation is not, it's not just based upon, oh, why well, is him, it's no big deal. No, it's every agency, every department, and then that money that goes, then what happens to the states and the rules and the procedures uh, and all those different things that has an impact on who is sitting in the Oval Office. It's, it's $4 trillion every single year spent. Um, you know, determined, you know, figured out how it's going to be distributed. It is the federal bench. It's, hey, you know, you know, okay, you have a Department of Justice that will file civil rights charges. Okay, what is that, you know, that judge or that appellate court or even the Supreme Court? going to do um, and how they're going to roll. You know, what most people have to understand is that most cases get, you know, dealt with at the federal or appellate level. Um, and so federal, the federal judges that are appointed, federal judges that are, are confirmed by the Senate absolutely matters. Um, it's, hey, you know, how is the president going to use his, his executive authority? Um, it's how the president's, you know, it, the, the, the vastness of the executive branch of the federal government is huge. Yep. It's monstrous. And people yeah. that think that, you know, Trump, another four years of that Trump is okay, you know, they're, they're just oblivious to what's going on. Well, let me go ahead and I'm going to end it this way and um, to ZARP on YouTube. Oh, Jesus. <laughs> Here we go, the lecture. I'm, I'm not fine with another four years of Trump, but we can walk and chew gum at the same time. No, it's not a damn lecture. It's called some stuff you don't even understand. I mean, I see the comments. I see the idiotic comments from people who literally say, ah, if I don't get reparations, I'm fine with Trump. Okay, here's my question. Is Trump going to sign that bill? <laughs> I'll wait. See, if you say this one thing I don't get, if it's woman of education, then what if you don't get it? No, it's understanding that not one issue, multiple issues, not just even one job. It's not even just the appointing of the federal judges. You gotta understand, Republicans are railroading folks through. Mm -hmm. It is literally a track meet. Because I need y'all to understand this. And when I play these clips from Selma, y'all gonna understand this. Do you understand that after Brown, see, let me just go ahead for all y'all out here. Here we go. Who don't know history? See, I wasn't really trying to go here. I was really trying to go to this break uh, so I could read this ad. But I need y'all to understand something. There were two Brown versus Board of Education rulings. Brown 1 was 1954. Brown 2 was 1955. What you also don't understand, that it was the federal courts that was the lower courts that was left to figure out Brown versus Board of Education. These are facts. Do you understand that law was created as a result of Brown versus Board of Education? Injunctions did not exist. That was a creation of the federal bench because you had folks in those southern states who were, they would have a ruling in a court in the morning and some legislators would pass a new law in the afternoon. And they would go back to court the next morning to get an injunction against that law. It happened in Louisiana, in Mississippi, in Virginia, in South Carolina, happened all those places. And what I'm trying to lay out to you is, it was the federal bench, the federal judges who were making those rulings, who were saying, Mississippi, you can't do this. Alabama, you can't do this. Uh, Georgia, you can't do this. And so for all y'all sitting here who are saying, ah, it's no big deal, they are putting people 
on the federal bench. They put on one woman who is 35 years Jesus. old. Mm. 11 years out of law school. They are putting people, one dude had never in his life, I need y'all to hear me, Donald Trump, aided by Senator Mitch McConnell, put a dude on a federal bench who had never in his life filed a legal motion. <laughs> I ain't a lawyer. I ain't never filed a legal motion. I got as much experience as that fool. <laughs> and some of y'all are saying, yeah, okay, that's fine. No. Do the math. We're 24 years away. I told y'all, we're 24 years away from America being a nation that is majority people of color, 2043. That judge who was 35, do y'all know how old she going to be in 2043? 59. Mm. Most federal judges serve today in their 70s and 80s. So let me do the math for y'all. If that one woman who's 35, if she's going to be 59 by 2043, let's say she stays on a bench until she is 80, which is, look at Ruth Bader Ginsburg, okay? Look at Ruth Bader Ginsburg. Numbers don't lie. That means that this one woman will be a federal judge until the year 2064. Mm -hmm. <laughs> Jesus. That means that when America becomes a nation, majority of people of color, she will serve, if she serves till she's 80, she might live longer. She will be serving another generation, another 21 years. And some of y'all are fine with that? Now, I know some people out there going, Ronald, you saying vote Democratic. Actually, no, I'm not. I'm saying don't vote for his ass. <laughs> <laughs> when I'm saying don't sit the hell at home, and let him get reelected. I want y'all to go listen to Reverend Jackson's 1984 speech at the Democratic National Convention. I want y'all to go listen to Reverend Jackson's speech at the 1988 Democratic National Convention and listen to him talk about leadership. Listen to him talk about moral authority. Listen to him talk about character and why that matters. Listen to him say he would rather have FDR in a wheelchair than Reagan on a horse. What you have right now literally are grifters in the White House. Got that right. Mm -hmm. Individuals who have no problem taking whatever. Th th this is the Trump administration right here. Zoom out. Zoom out. This is Trump administration. Should I can grab this? <laughs> I can grab this. I can grab this. Mm -hmm. Here, why don't you take this? That's what you got going on right now. That's true. And we got folks who are sitting here saying, I'm not going to vote. It don't matter. You lost your damn mind. Now, it's 2019. The election is not until 2020. But I'm telling you right now, black folks better wake the hell up and realize that this attack ain't on illegal immigrants. It's not about undocumented workers. What you have going on right in here is an attack on people of color. And he is pressing the buttons. He is aided by Fox News. He is aided by conservative talk radio because there is fear of black and brown people. Mm -hmm. There is fear of the takeover of America. And they want to hold on to this power as long as they can. So some of y'all can sit here and attack other black folks and attack people who say, uh, I'm not going to support this man, but I'm telling you something right now. You will rue the day if you got to deal with another four years of this madman sitting in the Oval Office. I'm just saying, don't be stuck on stupid and don't sit here and act like what's happening does not matter because you, because trust me, the right 
they know the importance of those federal judges. Oh, good Lord, yeah. Why do you think they fight so hard to get them? Why do you think they held open that seat that Merrick Garland was supposed to have? Why do you, and also Obama should have pointed a black woman. Why do you mm-hmm. think that they are ignoring the blue slips? Why do you think that they weren't so concerned about losing the House, but they damn sure didn't want to lose the Senate because they know the courts in America decide law. Last one for you. A civil rights law was passed in 1875. Eight years later, the United States Supreme Court in 1883 overruled that Civil Rights Act, and they said civil rights is really up to the states, and the 1883 Supreme Court forbid Congress from banning segregation. The United States Supreme Court is the highest court in the land. Don't think for a second Republicans don't want to use it as a weapon to take their views and their values and make it law in America, not for the next four years, not for the next 10 years, but literally for the next 100 years. Don't get it twisted. Going to a break. We'll be back in a moment. Hey, fam, I want you to like, share, and subscribe to our YouTube channel, youtube.com forward slash Roland S. Martin. And don't forget to turn on your notifications. Martin. All right, folks, uh, beginning of the year, of course, uh, I uh, participated in the uh, D-Earth's Full Body Cleanse. And, of course, it was about losing some weight. It's about getting healthier. I got to get my golf game because, see, I got to take more of Michael's money. Uh, and so uh, for, uh, for a lot of us, uh, we lose weight for various reasons. We want to feel better. We want to look better. Uh, but at the end of the day, it also comes down to uh, your health. D-Earth's Full Body Cleanse is a way for you to do that, a way for you to actually uh, cleanse your body, remove the toxic stuff, all the bad stuff that you've been eating. It's about, again, basically restarting and also changing yourself mentally in terms of how you approach eating, the foods that you want to eat, whether it's uh, fresh fruits and whether it's vegetables, whether it's water, things along those lines. And so uh, we want you to participate in that if you want to, uh, and we appreciate them being a partner with us. And so you can go to dherbs.com, dherbs.com, and that is you can try the full body cleanse. They have 27 different cleanses. So I did the 20-day cleanse. I previously did the 10-day cleanse. And so you can try the different ones. Uh, you can go to dherbs.com, use the promo code Roland to get a discount when you check out. You can also, though, call 866-4-D-HERBS, 866-4-D-HERBS. Now, it's been a, you know, been, you know five, or six, five or six weeks since I finished it, but how it changed my thinking in terms of what I ate, when I ate, and how I ate also is critically important. So go to dherbs.com or call 866-4-D-HERBS. Don't forget to use the promo code ROLAND if you want to get that discount. And so, again, we thank D-Herbs for being uh, a partner of the show. And also, this is a black-owned company. Uh, remember that, okay? Brother who, owned, who started this, CEO He's a brother, and so we also want to support uh, black-owned businesses. All right, folks, this weekend, uh, we were at Roller Martin on the Filter. We were in Selma uh, for the 54th annual Selma Jubilee, which commemorates uh, Bloody Sunday. There were all kinds of events taking place, various workshops, also the Poor People's Campaign. Uh, they had a town hall on Friday. Uh, they had the, uh, the uh, Freedom Flame Awards taking place Saturday night. And then, of course, uh, the uh, service at Brown Chapel AME that took place on Sunday, where Senator Cory Booker was the keynote speaker. The prayer breakfast was that morning. The honor of us, former Secretary of State Hillary Clinton. Then there was a march across the Edmund Pettus Bridge. And so we were there for all of that. This we're about to show is a recap of that. If you want to see all the coverage, go to our YouTube channel. We live stream the entire weekend, so we want you to go check it out. So go to youtube.com forward slash Roland Martin. Here's the recap, though, of what took place in Selma this weekend. He said, he said, the whole history of the anti-slavery movement is studded with proof that all measures devised and executed with a view to allow and diminish the anti-slavery agitation has only served to increase, intensify, and embolden that agitation. I want to just suggest at the end of this that all that's going on, Trump and his lies and his lies about voting and all in these states and the voter suppression, maybe this season we're in might be the last link uh, in the necessary chain of events 
Lord have mercy, to lead to the kind of coalition and resistance in this moment for the overthrow of the full system of racism. Because the truth of the matter is, every time there has been an attempt to stop justice, there's always been a people that instead of stopping them, it emboldened them. It emboldened them. It emboldened them and increased their agitation. I suggest today we ought to be emboldened. And I suggest today we ought to be agitated. And I suggest today we ought to come together. Lawyers sue like hell in the court. Those of us that can't go in the court march and protest like hell in the street. Push our legislators and our congressmen, for this might be the moment that was necessary to wake us up again. I also need you to vote in every election. Every election. What has happened is we have allowed our system of voting and our thinking about what our responsibility is to be hijacked by the presidential election. Now, the presidential election, if you don't know how important it is by now, I can't even help you because what we are living through right now is evidence that the presidential election is critical and important and you have no excuse for not participating in the primary and in the general election. We have lots of candidates running on one side, one candidate running on the other side. Let's hear the policies. Let's not put this into personalities. Let's hear the policies. Let's hear the vision they have for our country. That's what we want and you gotta vote in that election. But here's the news. Elections in this country do not happen every four years. Elections happen every year. There are elections this year wherever you live. There are municipal elections coming up in the city of Montgomery, Alabama. City council and mayor. I need you to vote. The probate judge was just here. You know what happens on election day when we come out and we man the polls and we have problems, people bring the wrong voting machine to the black polling place? You know who we have to call? The probate judge. So if you're in the election booth and you vote for the president and you vote for the governor and you vote for the senator and you vote for Representative Sewell and then you see the probate judge election, you say, I don't know them. That's a problem. So wherever you live and call your cousins and your family and tell them every election, the school board, the county commission, the probate judge, the railroad commissioner, the constable, the justices of the peace, every election, we have given away our power even you who chastise young people and tell them how people died on the bridge, you don't even vote in every election. Because when you see the DAs, you don't even know who they are. It's time out for that. Now we have to vote in every, every election if we're to honor those who came before us. And finally, let me just say that you know that the scripture says that faith without works is dead. And so if you are a believer, it is your obligation to engage in the work of justice, to engage in the work of peace, to engage in the work of truth. Those of us who have dedicated our lives to doing this work every day, we don't ask you to do it every day. We just ask you to show up in the moments when you can make a difference and never let anyone tell you that you can't make a difference. You can make a difference. And if we are to honor the Bernard Lafayettes, and the Viola Liozos, and the John Lewises, and the Thurgood Marshalls, and the Constance Baker Motleys, if we are to truly honor them, then we should be able to ask ourselves, give yourself a one month check past 30 days, what did I do to advance the work that those who came before me did to make it possible for us to sit together like this, looking like we do in this church in peace. It is our sacred obligation as citizens of this country, as people of faith, as African American people who were brought to this, this land in shackles, it is our obligation. We've gathered today because if the lion is unable to tell his own story, the hunter will. We must tell the truth. We've come to Brown Chapel under Selma every year because this is the place that truth spoke loudly to America. For truth is what love looks like in public. Truth walked out of this church towards a bridge that brought out this nation's unrelenting commitment to racialize oppression through state-sanctioned violence. And here we are today as the Department of Justice has failed twice this past week to defend black life from state-sanctioned violence, we must tell the truth. We must tell the truth after we have received reports of abuse of migrant children in state-sanctioned cages, we must tell the truth. 
We must tell the truth. As 2.5 million people are incarcerated in this country, we must tell the truth. We must tell the truth that there are food deserts in Selma, Alabama. We must tell the truth. We must tell the truth that African Americans still in this country are twice the unemployment rate in this country. We must tell the truth. There is no way we can get to an economy that works for everybody, that produces good jobs and rising incomes and inclusive prosperity if we don't protect the right to vote. There is no way we can have guaranteed quality, affordable health care if we don't protect the right to vote. There is no way we can deal with any problem, whatever it is that you are worried about, if we don't protect the right to vote and then if people don't get up and actually go to vote. And when you heard the report from the LDF, I hope you paid attention. Because I was in the Senate, Sherrod was there. I, I'm not sure if you were there yet, Corey, but we were there when we passed in the United States Senate, 98 to nothing, the reauthorization of the Voting Rights Act. We had a Republican president, George W. Bush, who said he would sign it, and he did. It was based on thousands and thousands of pages of testimony as to why we still, as a nation, devoted to the law and liberty that should guarantee every one of us equality, needed the Voting Rights Act. I thought it was a done deal. Passed out of the Congress, signed by a Republican president, and then it found its way to the Supreme Court because I want you to just never forget. There is an other side in America, and they never give up. They never quit. They're never discouraged. They are motivated every single day to try to pull back rights, to try to suppress rights, to try to prevent people from fulfilling their own God-given potential. And so they did go to work. And when they went to work, they found a receptive Supreme Court who came up with the most absurd decision. There are a lot of absurd decisions, but this is in many ways the most absurd. The Congress is supposed to legislate based on evidence and facts, which we did, and then it gets up to the Supreme Court and they say, oh, uh, you don't need that anymore. We, we don't need that voting rights stuff. You don't, you don't have to hold states and municipalities accountable. We're, we're beyond all that now. What nonsense absolute absurd nonsense. And what was the result? They gutted the Voting Rights Act. I was the first person who ran for president without the protection of the Voting Rights Act. And I will tell you, it makes a really big difference. Give a special nod to the Reverend Jesse Jackson, not just because he's Reverend clergy, but because he's the first person I ever voted for. I was 18 years old in 1988 football player at Stanford University, and I cast my first vote of my life for the man to my left, and I want to thank him for being a trailblazer in my life. I want to remind you that this church gathered in this sanctuary at a time that they were making it illegal for black folk to gather together. And even though it was illegal, on the day of the march, folk gathered here together, understanding that when two or three are gathered together in his name, he is in the midst. But it was 600 that came together that knew that in that unity is strength. Uh -huh. That in the midst of raging hate, you can still form a sanctuary of love, that you can still form a beloved community. They gathered as a testimony that the true definition of hope is not allowing despair to ever have the last word. Yeah, yeah. And together in unity, they began their march across a bridge, together in courage, together in faith, together in a love that was not a feeling, but a verb, a love that demands sacrifice and action. They marched together across that bridge. Yeah, yeah. And they marched into history. Hmm. I want to take a step back and let you know that we are here because of that stubborn, defiant love. We are here 
I, I was one of those young boys growing up. My parents got upset walking around like I had somehow earned the privileges of my time. My dad is like, boy, don't you walk around this house like you hit a triple. <laughs> you were born on third base. My parents brought me up knowing I owed a debt. You mentioned all my degrees. My dad was like, boy, you got more degrees in the month of July, but you ain't hot. <laughs> Life ain't about the degrees you get, it's about the service that you give. Again, folks, you want to see the full speech by Senator Cory Booker, go to Roland Martin, uh, go to my, uh, Roland Martin Unfiltered YouTube channel, youtube.com forward slash Roland S. Martin. Uh, real quick, uh, final comments. Michael. Um, I can't wait for 2020. Hopefully during the uh, Democratic nomination process, we pick somebody and two people. You know, I'm a, I've said I'm a Biden-Harris person because I think they check all the boxes. Well, you know, the bottom line is that we have to get out here and vote. I agree. We don't have time to be messing around. We just need to make sure that people understand the importance of this election, take it seriously, and make sure that our voices are heard. Who, who do I want? Hashtag team whip that ass. <laughs> That's what I want. That's a good I, I, I need That's a good hashtag That's team, T-E-A-M, W-H-I-P, D-A-T-A-S-S. -S. Team that. whip that ass. All right, now. I'm telling you, the only way you're going to beat Trump is if you ready to swing. Now, if you got somebody who's trying to run and they ain't ready to swing, not get all that Obama hope, make you feel good. No, 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 no. You need somebody who's going to swing, who's going to say, you lying <laughs> again, <laughs> lying again. And y'all can go ahead and use my hashtag Trump Lives Matter. And <laughs> if y'all want to talk to them crazy white folks who losing their damn farms because of the tariff deal, y'all can use hashtag we tried to tell you. Go right ahead. I give you liberties to use it, but I'm telling you right now, for black folks, sit your ass at home, no whining and complaining. Say, oh my God, I don't have all my issues addressed. You're stuck on stupid. <laughs> yeah, take a and, look then, and then when you're getting screwed by folks, <laughs> I tell you what I say, if you don't vote, shut the hell up. Simple as that. Y'all want to support Roland Martin Unfiltered? Go to RolandMartinUnfiltered.com, join our Bring the Fuck fan club. Uh, Friday, we're going to roll the video of all the folks who have given to us, and we certainly look forward to that. If you want your name on that, go to the website right now. You can give via the Cash cash app, uh, PayPal, uh, Square as well. You can give monthly. You can give, uh, of course, at one time. But every single dollar goes to support us going to Selma. We've got some other trips planned for this month. You can see, unlike a whole bunch of, go ahead and drop the music. Let me just go ahead this last one. And I didn't really mean to go here. I know we're over our time, but i got to go ahead and say this. It's a whole bunch of sorry-ass people who call themselves new black media, who all they do is sit behind a damn camera and behind a desk, and you ain't never seen them at any black events. <laughs> Let me just go ahead and say that, okay? See, I don't just stand behind uh, this table. I actually go out and talk to people, actually uh, go to places like Selma, go to Montgomery, go to Birmingham, go where folks are. See, that's what we do on Roland Martin Unfiltered. So the rest of y'all out here who call y'all selves new black media, why don't y'all do what old black media did? Get the hell up and go actually talk to black people and not just behind a microphone. Go actually cover something. Bring the cameras where the people are and talk to the people. Because see, some folks play at this. I chose at 14 to be a journalist. I don't play at this, okay? This is what I committed my life to do. And so that's why we want you to support what we do because we're about covering our story from our perspective and not just sitting here just chat, 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 don't cover nothing. So for those of you, we, we want to be able to fund folks to be on the campaign trail, be out there doing interviews with people as well. And so that's what our focus is. So that's how we roll on this show. And if there's some of you out there who didn't like my commentary on this very issue today, I don't really give a damn if you didn't, because you know why? You ain't a real journalist, and I am. Holla! <laughs> oh, damn. <laughs>